My father didn't have much of a chance for education. He's a widow's son and raised during the Depression. My mother, on the other hand, came from a long line of educators. You could say I got it from both parents. Education was to be a high priority and homework was to be done. Grades were looked at and grades were expected. I believe that all the privileges I've had come from the heritage of growing up right out of the little school district in southern Utah. Jeffrey R. Holland It was 1861. Tattered pioneers began arriving in southern Utah. Many traveled across unforgiving plains for the opportunity to build up a place they could call their own, amid sacrifice and loss. One by one, families in the Salt Lake City area answered the call to move south for the prospect of growing cotton. With determination and will, they came. St. George was officially chartered on January 17, 1862. The region soon became known as Utah's Dixie. And among the town's first settlers was a young industrious immigrant from Berkshire, England, Thomas Judd. When Thomas arrived in 1864, the population of Washington County was nearing 700, and he brought with him the charge to help establish a self-sufficient economy. By 1890, settlement communities throughout the region were beginning to take shape, and education was a top priority. The first state-funded schoolhouse opened in Virgin. By this time, the county population had grown to 4,000, and at the center of it all, was the newly constructed St. George Tabernacle. Soon after the Tabernacle's dedication, eager educators moved school classes into the building's sizable basement. But to the town's disappointment, heat, lack of ventilation, and poor lighting conditions proved too difficult to bear. The following year, community leaders agreed to a two-cent tax increase to construct a suitable building for learning at the center of town. It'd be located on the same block as the tabernacle, constructed with the same quarried sandstone. In 1901, the Woodward Building opened for the sole purpose of centralizing and modernizing education in southern Utah. Located at the heart of the town, Woodward would come to stand as a beacon for opportunity, representing the community's foundational commitment to education and learning. With a dream of bringing the library to St. George, Thomas Judd, now serving as mayor, led the effort by applying for funding from the Andrew Carnegie Library Foundation. He also established a mercantile and began providing supplies to local builders. And in 1914, $8,000 was granted and construction began on the city's first library between the Tabernacle and Woodward School. In 1915, the state of Utah issued an order for the county's scattered school districts to join together as one at this time, elementary schoolhouses had been constructed in Laverkin, Washington, New Harmony, Santa Clara, and Leeds. On June 30th, 1915, the Washington County School District was formed with nearly 2,000 students. In 1916, W.O. Bentley would take over as superintendent and serve 13 years establishing district procedures and standards for education. In 1929, M.E. Moody became superintendent, leading the charge for education through the Great Depression and World War II. Lavoy Esplin next served from 1958 to 1979, overseeing an enrollment increase to 6,500 students. 
and a facilities increase to 30 district buildings. With vision and fortitude, these early superintendents would establish a solid foundation for education in Southern Utah. The infrastructure and standards they established would continue to support exponential growth and provide support to students for generations to come. Today, a hundred years later, Southern Utah is a place that many call home with a population now nearing 150,000. More than 28,000 students are enrolled in the Washington County School District. At the heart of the town has always been education, and education has always been a valued priority. My entire growing up school years were within, were within 75 yards of each other. We used to crawl in and out of the windows in this room, in this building, you know, when the teacher was out, crawl out of the windows and take off. And they knew we went over to Judd's to spend our money. And I was like straight A, teacher's <laughs> pet, did every extracurricular thing you could do. I remember one time I got my name written on the board for talking and I thought the world was over. <laughs> one time. Everybody knows about dragging Maine. That was our way to keep in touch with our friends. We saw everybody there, carloads of kids. Started riding a bus when I was probably in the second grade and I rode it up until I turned 16. And I had me a car by then. In high school, my favorite teacher was Mr. Barbin. He was such a nice guy. Just incredibly great to work with and uh, didn't call on me too much. I always liked that. I still, uh, if I have a drink of, of um, pineapple orange juice, even now, 50 some odd years later, it reminds me of kindergarten because that's the juice we would drink was pineapple orange juice. It was 1931 when five-year-old Edna Mae Miller started kindergarten. I have a picture of my kindergarten class, and I noticed I was the only one of the girls that had a big full ribbon in her hair. I thought, my mother must have loved me too, but they never ribbon my hair that day. With an interest in music, Edna May would later attend Woodward School and become a member of the school band. And I played the clarinet all the way through. I started, I think, when I was in the sixth grade, fifth grade or sixth grade, uh, and uh, I was had a my reed broke for my clarinet, so I went out to the water fountain, excused myself from the band, Stan Smoots was the band director. Boy, it was a, I don't know if you've heard any stories about him, but 35 or 40 kids tooting their horns, trying to get it quietened down, you know. He, he would take the erasers and throw at us. Boy, he got to be a really good shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to get our attention, you know. Quiet down, quiet down. Well, I went outside in the hall to get some water for the, to wet down my reed to put on my clarinet. And I put it on and I started to two to try to get it going. And here came N.R. Fry out the door. What are you doing out here? And I said, well, I'm, who was he? He was the principal. And he was, he was a sweet guy underneath, but he was really tough and tried to be tough. And he said, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, my reed broke and I'm just out. Well, you can't toot that one in this hall, you know. And I said, well, I've just seen if it worked. And he said, you'll have to write a theme. He called it a theme, write a theme and give it to me. And I want it on my desk by tomorrow morning because I had made a noise in the hall with my clarinet because it tooted. So I wrote this theme, and I remember it was called, If You Don't Toot Your Own Horn, Nobody Else Will Toot It For You. <laughs> and from then on, he was my friend. October 11, 1944. Janine suggests there be fines for members being late to the student council meetings. Greg moved that 10 cents be charged for being late without an excuse, 10 cents for talking out of turn in the meeting. Janine seconded the motion, and it was passed. October 25th, 1944. Mr. Fry fined 10 cents for being late. 
Heber Jones was one of four students in his class attending a small country school in Vail when news of pending change came to southern Utah. Well, the school district changed the policy on uh, uh, small town schools, and if you were in the seventh grade, everybody was bused to Woodward that was in this area. That is, that would be Vail and Gunlock and Santa Clara and Leeds and around that way. Learning to uh, get along with the rich and the poor and the educated and the uneducated, all this was a new experience for me. Like all small towns, there were those who were all upset about it and thought we ought to stay there, and those who thought, well, they'll get better opportunities there. And there was the, the crowds that you even get today when things change. Heber graduated Dixie High School, went on to earn a bachelor's degree in education at the University of Utah, and a master's degree in American history at Utah State University. The young school teacher would later return to Southern Utah to teach social studies till his retirement. The 1950s and 60s were happy days in Southern Utah. Citizens rallied around the town's growing business community and high school sports. Well, you know, back then we were the only high school in town, so we were pretty strong spirited and we used to have competitions or kind of little fights with Cedar and Cedar was the only high school in Cedar and, and I will never forget the time that Gary Picklesheimer flew a plane up there before one of our games up there and dropped blue flyers all over the campus. And that's just the kind of things that, that went along with the two school competitions. It was blood that ran over the, uh, over the uh, Washington County, Iron County border. And uh, they were always good. They were always terrifically good. But when they came to play us in my senior year, we left at the half to go into the locker room with a 45 to seven lead. And so we thought that was a good way to go into the locker room. Outside the classroom, students engaged in social activities that became an important part of the educational experience in Southern Utah. Perhaps just as significant as cheering at games was frequenting Judd's store. Every school was within about a block and a half of the store. So all the way from kindergarten to college because the high school and the college was together at that particular time. So the store was within reach of all the students that went here to Washington County School District. Probably one of their biggest items was Levi's. All the boys wore Levi's. I would often uh, save my money up and I didn't buy a lot of pot and candy. I'd buy 22 bullets and go hunting. In those days, kids could buy guns and ammunition and bullets and what have you. They actually made it a, a close the boundaries of school and would not let the kids go to Judd's. And there was such an uproar that they made the boundaries again to include Judd's store. February 23rd, 1955. Dixon Moore and Marilyn Fawson came to our meeting to bring up the matter of profanity, suggesting the idea of a non-profanity club. Mr. N. R. Fry suggested having posters, giving talks over the microphone, reinforcing laws, appointing committees, etc. To a small and tightly knit community, there were times when world events would pierce its sense of security and safety. My then future husband ended up being drafted. After we were married, he ended up being drafted and went to Vietnam and served in Vietnam. And of course, all of that time with Vietnam and everything, it was, it was a crazy time. I just remember how horrified I was. We really only had a month of marriage before I knew that he was going to leave. Uh, it was frightening to our whole community in Santa Clara. And it was happening to young men all through here in St. George area as well and throughout the United States. You know, being married, uh, 
my husband was gone, I guess, you know what, it really did impact me. Yeah, I'd gone to war and I didn't know that I could focus on my schoolwork. I considered dropping out, so I guess, yes, I did have a hard time. And I'll tell you a little story about a sweetheart angel of a person, and that would be Rose Bostwick. She was Principal Cameron's secretary. And I went in to tell her I was going to drop out and check out, and she said, Pam, you can't do that. She says, don't do that. You've only got a few months left. You can do this. And the more she talked, the more I thought, you know what, maybe I can do this. And thank you, Rose Bostwick, you angel up in heaven. She helped me graduate. It was war, and uh, the first two men that were killed in the war, and they brought the bodies home. And that was the first time that, that the war really struck home, but that was here. And it was a whole town, you know, because we were so small. And, and uh, Keith Hafen was the son of the coach at Dixie College, Lee Hafen's boy. And, and how that struck home and it finally made it real. War, war became real. February 18, 1948, Marietta made a motion that we sing our school song in every assembly except on this Friday, Washington's birthday. On this day, we sing America. The motion was seconded by Maxine. Teachers play a significant role in the lives of their students, carrying out responsibilities on a daily basis. With commitment, they convey and care and instill confidence and create an environment of safety and love. One day, uh, a woman came to the door of our room and walked through that door, and immediately everyone knew who she was because she was known in the school. But she looked at me. She was the remedial reading teacher. And yet, it was per perhaps one of the greatest things that's ever happened in my life. And Lois Wells is another um, just legendary person in the Washington County school system. She taught a lot of kids to read. She was the nicest, most sweetest, most loving person you can imagine. And she sat there with me and started to work with me. By the end of third grade, I was reading. I remember that my first grade teacher, Mrs. Crawford, um, took the bus. I can't remember whether she lived in Rockville or Springdale, but she took the bus and that bus arrived very early. Uh, my memory, if it is correct, says it was like an hour before school started. But uh, I loved her so much that I remember on many occasions going to school an hour early so that I could be there at the bus stop when Mrs. Crawford uh, got off the bus. She held a very special spot in my heart. One of the things I liked about Mr. Barbin in high school is that he would protect me. He'd let me just do my homework, do what it was asked, and I would just do it, and I'd feel very safe in his class, and he was just a really nice guy. February 18th, 1959. Brooks made the motion that Peggy Doug and Barbara be put on the committee for the Good Study Habits campaign. We will contact local merchants and interest them in giving prizes in the form of $1 and $1.50 merchandise certificates to students who study 10 hours or more per week. Often, skilled students learn in the classroom, create opportunities and interests that last for life. One thing that I really loved about her class was we did a, a Shakespeare play a first night and I was Malvolio, and I loved doing that play. We went and performed for other schools, and she was super into Shakespeare too. And um, what third grade teacher brings Shakespeare to class and really pounds it into you like she did? I just had so much fun with it, and that was kind of the first time where I realized that I made the audience laugh, or I made the audience react in some way, and that was really fun. In high school here, I took a cooking class, and I, I know about cooking. You wash your hands first, and then we'll, like, the teacher will get us what to make, and then we'll make it. Sometimes I'll make your breakfast, like sauces, eggs, mm. something like that. And I made dinner for my family one time. 
Well, I didn't think of this until I started going back and looking at the yearbook that I was in a tech class. And I worked on lights. I worked on for the theater and the assemblies. And that's actually what I do now when on our live shows. I'm doing the lights. I'm a part of the visuals, doing the video. And so it's pretty cool to know that something I did in high school now prepared me for what I'm doing in my career today. Today, with advances in technology and instant access to global information, students open their minds and classrooms to the world, resulting in new types of dreams and opportunities. I think the future of schools is embedded in technology. I think of when I first started teaching 18 years ago to now, and I mean 18 years ago I had one computer in my classroom and it was the teacher computer. Classrooms are very technology based. I have a smart board in my classroom, I have 10 iPads. From chalkboard to whiteboards and now we're on electronic whiteboards that are written on with electronic pens. It's an amazing technological tool given to teachers to bring the world into their classroom. And that's really where, we're, where we are now. The internet has changed the world. There's many administrators throughout the state that would love to be in St. George, Utah. Not just the climate and the atmosphere and the community, but with the people in the school district that's viewed as being a very proactive, successful, positive place to work. We're a unique school district. We have unique problems. We have unique opportunities that face us here in Washington County School District because of our size and also because of our location away from the Wasatch Front. You know, every kid has the right uh, to be educated and be provided the best opportunity to be successful and accomplish in life what they would like. If you were to ask me what is important to me as superintendent of Washington County School District now and moving forward, it would be to ensure high levels of learning for every student within the boundaries of our responsibilities on a daily basis to make sure that they uh, have the, the most adequate opportunities as they move forward from here. The parents feel supported in what opportunities are available to their students and that we then allow them to move on to post-secondary education with the highest level of skills, knowledge, and aptitudes to be successful in life. That is one of the things that education does for people is change them, and certainly did with me. I've had the chance to go there and pursue their dream. Maybe they didn't even know they had dreams. Maybe they didn't have dreams till they got there. It's, uh, the legacy is, is in the lives of the students, and thank heavens for those teachers and administrators who believe that, who have made a career uh, coaching the next generation, believing in the next generation. And you could really see the people uh, change. And that's really uh, uh, the key to it. You, you've got to have something that the kids need and are interested in and that you can put across. And as a teacher, what was your greatest joy? Seeing the kids. Um, move up and move on and move on yes one more thing mr. fry said damn which is the terrible thing to have to put in the school records however it may reveal to future generations the true nature of our principal